the microphones because I'm a bit shorter. Okay, um, <clears throat> we wanted to give you an overview here of how things are changing in the marketplace. So there's a lot of chat about leak detection and repair being the solution for emissions, as well as all that design technology that's going into the valve designs and geometries and sealing mechanisms and all that good stuff. Leak detection and repair is the common approach that we see across industry with a view to how we're going to make this route to net zero happen. So I'm just going to start with a case study here. The case study is that we had a customer who was about to go and spend two and a half million dollars on putting an air scrubber on their flare lines so that they could reduce their flaring emissions. We said, why are you going to do that? Because at the end of the day, you should just be stopping the flare emissions at source. In other words, that is through seat leakage in a valve somewhere in your system. So why not just fix that valve and you won't have the problem with the emissions in the first place? And the answer to that question, of course, is, well, we don't know which of our many valves are causing the problem. So in order to help that customer, we did a survey uh, using some specialist equipment and tools to identify the source of those leakages. And we found 615 tonnes worth of gas leaking from just eight valves on the customer's process plant. The, the survey was done on a total of 62 valves. Now, the end result, of course, means that you're doing eight valve repairs instead of 62 valve repairs. If you know exactly which eight valves are causing the problem, that's the ones that are going to get fixed. So within just four days, and I'm going to talk about scopes of emissions in a second, within just four days of surveying for one of our customers, we had identified emissions reductions that were the equivalent of our entire score group operations scope one and scope two emissions by two thirds. So you take all of scores emissions at our 30 locations, scope one and scope two, two thirds of it was gone with a four day survey where we reduced the customer's emissions by 615 tons. So there's big prizes and they're easy to capture if we use the right tools. And that's part of the message that I want to give you here today. Lots of different ways people are talking about reducing emissions. We've got four options in that pathway. We can reduce, replace, remove, or offset. Redu reduction of emissions is all about how we operate our plant. Can we make it more efficient? Can we stop consuming the same amount of energy uh, in our processes? Can we make them more efficient? Can we replace that energy set? So is it coming from fossil fuels? which are creating emissions, or are we doing it, um, producing that electric from uh, renewable energies, such as wind or solar. Uh, in terms of removal, again, you hear a lot about uh, carbon capture and storage mechanisms. That's about the emissions have already happened. We now just need to recapture them and put them in some other storage place so that they're not causing a negative impact on the environment. And of course, the last option is to offset. So offsetting, you very often hear people talking about um, some of these large organizations. Well, we're, we're planting thousands of trees in location X so that by 2050, we've got this offset of what we've caused damage to the environment. We're now offsetting that by producing all this new oxygen from these trees. Just to put that into perspective, the CEO of Oxfam in the UK asked for a, a, an independent survey to be carried out on just how many trees it would take to be planted to offset Oxfam's uh, emissions and make it net zero by 2050? And the answer was an area of land five times the size of India. If, that's, if we're going to get to net zero just by planting trees, we're going to have to plant five times the square mileage of India with trees. And when you do that, of course, you also remove your ability to use that land for agriculture. So you create a food chain issue. So offsetting through planting trees is not the answer, it's not the solution. Energy transition is part of that. I've already mentioned renewable energies. Uh, all of the big operating companies who we traditionally work with in the oil and gas sector have massive uh, plans in place and strategies to take this forward um, and, and support that transition to green energy production, whether it's through the 
methods I've mentioned already or through hydrogen production, blue, green and all the various variants and colours of hydrogen that are being talked about. One thing is absolutely sure and certain, the compliance requirements are changing, they're becoming more stringent. Uh, we've heard about IOGP, that is just one of a number of things coming down track one for operators that they're going to have to address moving forward. What is very often lost in that discussion is there's huge financial benefits and advantages of going down this pathway. So it's not just in terms of um, reduction of risk, um, sustainability for the environment of the operation, it's, it's about making things more efficient as well. When you use, use the right tools, we're getting all these other add-on benefits that shouldn't be ignored. ESG is replacing mission, vision and values. So where we used to have that mission statement on the wall at the C-suite in our major operating companies, that's now replaced with a purpose statement and environmental social governance is right in the middle of that. So these, these big organisations are taking it really seriously and so they should and we're trying to support and help them at every step of the way. We see a varying picture as we go around the world. SCORE is a multinational company, we're in 30 locations around 20 plus countries and so it's important that we keep abreast of how these changes are happening in each individual market. Uh, regulations and guidelines are coming down track one regardless of where you are sitting. It's not just uh, these high level uh, climate change conferences that come into play. There are legislation documents being written even as we speak here that's going to make it harder and harder to operate in an environmentally acceptable fashion moving forward. So everyone's aware of that. We're all clambering for compliance, you know, as responsible operating companies, we're doing that anyway, but it's just going to get that little bit harder. In terms of um, emissions reduction, it's pretty well known that intended and unintended flaring represents the biggest prize, the easiest reduction will come from there because that's where most of the emissions are coming from in the first place. If we go to the UK, for example, the Oil and Gas Authority will tell you that represents about 75% of the total emissions in the UK. So if we could just get a handle on limiting intended and unintended flaring and venting actions, then we'd be a long way down that route towards our net zero goals and targets. Regardless of where you are in the world, these compliance requirements are uh, being more and more documented. Uh, the bad news for the guys that we work with in uh, Canada and America is that uh, their Environmental Protection Agency has uh, renewed teeth under the current White House administration, and so uh, their route to net zero is being accelerated on a daily basis. I said I would mention the scopes. So this is quite well documented. Scope 1, 2 and 3 emissions is what we're really going after. Scope 1 is all the emissions that you are generating as a result of uh, your manufacturing process. So whatever it is that you're manufacturing, you're consuming electric, um, you're consuming raw materials, and so there's, a, there's an impact to the climate in, in terms of those emissions coming from Scope 1. Scope 2 is how we uh, gain our energy. Where is that coming from? What is the source? Is it that fossil fuel uh, traditional energy production or are we already transitioning across to some of these more renewable energies? And I live in a place in Scotland called Dunfermline where a valve manufacturer called FMC has built a 120 foot tall wind turbine right in the middle of a historic town. You can imagine what kind of response that got from the locals. But they're taking it responsibly, they're trying to move towards that renewable energy position, albeit that there are some compromises that have to be made when we make those decisions. The scope three emissions is, as we bundled here, everything else. So scope three are the hardest emissions to try and manage and reduce, because what you're talking about there is the whole value chain of not just your suppliers and their sub-suppliers, it's also about what your products are used for and how they're used once they go into uh, that use case scenario somewhere in the world being used by an end user. So it's that whole life cycle from the very original piece of raw material being turned into something and then being supplied and then used at the end. That scope three emissions um, space is the hardest one to manage and control. 
and it's going to be for another day. I think if we can get a, a handle on scope one and scope two, we'll be a long way down the route to net zero by 2050. So I've spoken about this in a bit of detail already. Uh, if you are picking up this presentation afterwards, you can see some of those definitions that I've uh, detailed out for you on that slide. We need a strategy to get to net zero. We can't just wake up in the morning and say, right, OK, what are the things we can do today? There are short, medium and long term things that we can immediately respond to or respond in a longer time period or, or look at some of those really radical change ideas that can be pitched for the longer term. We, we can't achieve those things immediately, but we should be focused on how we're going to get there, what we're going to do to make these things happen. So this is a, um, almost like a five-year plan that we're, we're, we're having in place to, to try and accelerate not just our own emissions, but how we're supporting our customers in our valve management contracts to help them reach their net zero targets as well. So lots of good ideas in this, but it's about having those measurable, tangible reductions and, and being able to deliver those in real time. So we've called that our emissions elimination program. It's, it's about how to get as fast as possible to net zero. We understand why we're trying to do it. There's a health and safety issue. There's an environmental issue. But as I said before, let's not forget about the financial benefits of going down this pathway. There are huge gains to be made by doing the right thing at the right time getting the right production in play at each moment in, its, in the plant's life cycle can have a massive impact on the efficiency and profitability of your operation. So why wouldn't you want to do that? In terms of reputation management, it's pretty obvious that anyone who's not going down this pathway is going to have a lot of finger pointing in their direction. So in terms of uh, PR, uh, I know that, again, coming back to my own personal situation, there's a a uh, chemical plant about five miles from my house, and every time that flare stack goes, the keyboard on the uh, switchboard on the telephone system lights up like a Christmas tree by locals phone and saying, you need to make that stop because I have uh, washing drying on my line and it's now getting covered in black soot. So reputation management is a key part of emissions reduction as well, and we shouldn't forget about that. So I've said a little bit already about sources of emissions. As a valve repair company, we have 40 years' worth of knowledge and experience of uh, repairing valves, seeing failure modes, looking at technologies, not just in terms of material improvements and design geometry improvements. Um, some of those seals that were being discussed earlier on, you know, what are the latest and greatest things that we can fit and where do they fit inside that valve assembly? It's about knowing where the source is. If you can identify the leakage at source, then the next thing that comes is you need to be able to do that as fast as possible. So what are the tools to get you there? How are we going to identify? Will we start with the failure mode? So in terms of all these uh, positions that we've highlighted here, um, we know that valves themselves contribute to 75% of all the emissions. So the valves are the key area, and that's why I'm at the valve conference telling the story right now. It's a little bit like the iceberg that we see uh, examples of. The iceberg, uh, some emissions are obvious and visible, others are not so obvious, not so visible. So different tools, different technologies required at each stage of our uh, inspection process to get us to that point. Already mentioned, of course, what we're looking for mostly is, is methane, because methane 86 times more pollutant to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So by uh, pollutant uh, scale, obviously, that's what we want to focus on. By volumetric scale, it would be the CO2. So where are the leaks coming from? How can we find them? The tools need to show us uh, each of those five key areas, and that's what we're going to focus on as we implement our emissions elimination program, methane being our primary target. Leak detection and repair, the common way of looking at things in my experience, a lot of leak detection companies will give you the report at the end of the survey period, and that report will sit in the maintenance department, and not very much will happen a lot of the time because they're busy doing reactive response repairs and they just don't have the time to get back to doing those things. So leak detection and repair for me is broken. There's a lot of LD and not enough AR. So how can we change that? How can we 
help that moving forward? Well, there's a key element to all these new standards that are coming out, and that is the reporting element. So we need, from an operator perspective, they want to find, scale, and predict where those leaks are coming from. And in terms of us supporting that, that means we need the right tools. We need the uh, correct and reliable quantification methodologies that are proven techniques so that we can trend and make that intervention at the optimum period. Not when it might be a tiny leak that nobody's really focused on. We want to go after the biggest leaks first. So for me, LDAR needs to change into LDQAR, and the Q stands for quantification. The quantification element of our surveys will give us the steer on where to deploy our available cost, time, and resource from our maintenance budget. If we don't quantify the leak rates, then we won't be able to make the maximum impact in the shortest possible time scale. So let's get the industry talking about the Q in LDAR. No point in fixing the tiny leaks if the city's burning behind you and you're the fire department. You could be the best guy at putting out the waste basket fire that ever lived, but you're missing the point. And I've said this, I've had this conversation with the EP in America as well. We need to get focused on quantification so that we can address top down. So lots of technologies coming into play here. In our route to net zero, all these technologies have a validity, they all have a place, they all have a purpose, but selection is the key. Going from that real high level micro, uh, macro stuff, where we're using the satellites to look at the super emitters, drilling down all the time through the uh, air vehicles, manned and unmanned air vehicles, drone technologies, coming right down to the uh, perimeter uh, monitoring systems, we've got the uh, permanently installed sensors on valves, even right down to the handheld tools. What is the source? If we can get to the source, we can make that emission go away because that's the point at which we do the and repair work. So we need all of the tools that are available in the toolkit. Not one tool on its own is going to give us all the answers and it's not going to give us the fastest route to net zero. So let's get everything in play knowing where to deploy it and how to deploy it is part of the intelligence behind this. So losses to flare and venting, what are the handheld tools, what are the earliest possible indications we can get there, leakages to atmosphere, losses to vents and drains, um, emissions coming from uh, energy sy production systems. You know, a lot of these plants will have their own uh, energy production on site. So getting all these systems in play, using the right technologies and the right tools will identify the sources that we can then attack with our specialist repair programs and technologies and techniques, methodologies. So to make this nice and simple for our customers, we've designed and developed this Ready Reckoner. And what this does is it says, if your emissions are X or Y or Z, then these are the technologies, this is how to deploy them, these are the procedures. And then once you've identified what's required in terms of the repair program, these are the repair methodologies as well. So this is a consistent, managed approach to making sure we get to net zero as soon as possible. Our own products, of course, have been designed and developed. The Midas Diagnostics range, again, I'm not really here to sell anything, but we are not the only company developing and designing tools. The key thing about our tools is we are entirely focused in the first instance on flaring and venting. Automating that system will give you the earliest possible indication that leakage is happening so you can address it and nip it in the bud. Now that early intervention gives you a massive advantage in your total emissions reduction because what happens is we reduce the time period that that emission is contributing to your total emissions. So I've got a graph to show you exactly that in a second, but again, for completeness, we've given you these two slides here. Midas Sensor and VMAP is our fully automated system, and Midas Meter is a handheld device where you can just go and troubleshoot. And don't underestimate the power of handheld tools here, because that first case study I showed you, where we reduced our customers' um, output in emissions by 615 tonnes with just four days' survey work, that was a handheld tool. It was the Midas Meter that did that. So quick and easy stuff to use is going to take you right to the money. So it's all about taking this find and fix approach, being out on site, doing a risk-based inspection methodology, managing risk on the basis of um, probability of failure and consequences of failure. This picture is actually from that gas, that um, chemical plant that I told you is five miles from my house. You can imagine how many phone calls they got the day this was happening. 
And uh, again, <laughs> not really what you want to be seeing. So our journey is nice and simple. We know where we're at today. If we have an existing monitoring system in play, we will know what our emissions are. If we're not, I urge you to get one and put it in place because that which cannot be measured does not exist, according to Lord Kelvin, the great uh, engineer of uh, previous eras. And so measure the right things. Once we know what our start point is, we can work out how to get to that net zero position as soon as possible. It's going to be through temporary, non-invasive methodologies layered up with invasive technologies at the correct time where we can have those planned outages. And minimizing the meantime between those major turnarounds also has a huge financial benefit as well. So getting control of all this, having the right data acquisition, doing the right analytics, and deploying the right maintenance resources at the right time has a multiplier effect and gives you all the benefits that you would ever want. It's not just about the leak detection, as I've said before. We need the and repair bit to be robust, consistently applied, and timelessly applied. So as early as possible, get the non-intrusive stuff done. That's giving you a major advantage straight away, immediately. And then the planned stuff can come along later. When we deploy this methodology, we can see on our graph here the total period during which emissions are happening. On the left-hand graph is a lot wider. When we've used the condition monitoring technology and got the earliest indication that leak was happening, we've converged those two dotted lines to be a lot narrower. And you can see in the green section how much we've been able to minimize the total emissions just by acting early. So the, the message here is um, quantification. Yes, that's part of it. Doing the repairs, yes, that's part of it. But doing it as fast as possible gives you another added layer of value. So here we are, again, just another little case study before we close here. Um, site survey, 540 tonnes per annum identified. Immediate data analysis carried out. So it's a simple four-step programme. We then focused our activities on what could be fixed in the non-intrusive sense. That was uh, giving us a 60% reduction immediately on our emissions. When it comes to step four, we've got that uh, planned outage element, which in this instance took us over 80% reduction in our emissions. So making sure we've got this joined up approach, you can see the actual work that was identified and carried out in order to make those 84% reductions happen. It's, it's joining all the dots together, that's the important thing. When we do that, we cannot help but reduce emissions. So target it, make it happen. And lots more case studies we can share with you. It's a win-win situation when we join what we're trying to do with our monitoring equipment and systems and help our customers and our customers deploy that, we're going to get to net zero in the shortest possible time scale. We'd like to go on that journey with every operator. Um, the more that's playing the game, the more resources we can uh, put in place to support that infrastructure and the faster we can make things happen. Working together is what's going to take us to net zero. There is no one organization on the planet that can do it on their own. Even we are collaborating with third-party tooling manufacturers so that we can support our valve management contracts with all of the available best practices that are available today. So when you partner with us, you get all the benefits of all the work we've already done, that 40 years worth of experience of repair techniques and methodologies added to what we're now doing in terms of our emissions monitoring programs. And that is our fastest route to net zero. We're working with all the standards committees. We're working, uh, I sit on the um, ISA committee over in Houston, looking at uh, layers and levels of diagnostic coverage and TR960502 is going to be the latest version of that, talking about diagnostic coverage level five and fully automated systems. That's the presentation that we made upstairs earlier on. Um, and, and again, we can share all that information if anyone didn't uh, have the chance to see that presentation. I know most of you were in here at that time, but um, if you want us to share that with you, just drop me your card and I can share that with you as well. We are excited about what the future can hold. We think we can make a massive impact and we think you as operators and you as manufacturers and you as service companies working with us can get us to that net zero. We don't think it's out at 2050. Some of the measures that we're looking at being declared by major operating companies, we could achieve that in the next five years if we deploy the right resources because a lot of this technology exists, it's just not being used yet. 
So we've got to get the adoption rates accelerated to get us on the right pathway. The measures that are being described as net zero by 2050, much faster achievable. Thank you for your time. If there are any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Alternatively, we are on uh, stand number six. I know some of you are a bit pressed for time. Um, if you want to come and have a chat, I'll be on stand six for the, for the rest of today. Um, I don't know, if, did you want to do any questions? Thank you, Dave. Yes, we have time for one or two questions, I think. Do you have some questions for Dave? Get an easy run. No question. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dave.